gentlemen. Morning. I'd like to take a minute to introduce a special guest to you this morning, Mr. William Henshaw, retired special agent in charge of the Atlanta FBI field office, who has been invited by the sheriff and me to be our guest this morning, and he has agreed to come over and listen to us, help us out a little bit, and we welcome him. Sheriff Brown and Lieutenant Gunner have invited me to come here this morning and talk to you a little bit about the Civil Rights era. And you're probably wondering, what's he know about that? Well, many of you were too young to have been there, but at 93 years old, I was not only there, I was part of a lot of the events of that day. And so, it was in the 50s and 60s, and I guess some of you weren't even around then, some of you young folks. But we're going to try to pass a little information on to you about the civil rights era and the law of 1964 that President Johnson passed, which forbid discrimination based on race, color, religion, sex, or national origin. Before that time, it was kind of segregated. Whites had their place, blacks had their place. And the blacks decided that they wanted to share more in the American dream. And why not? We're all American citizens. Everybody deserves equal rights. We got those rights guaranteed us under our Constitution. Back then, I was a special agent with the FBI, and that's how I got involved in a lot of the activities in this area, being assigned at that time to the Atlanta Field Office. When my wife heard that I was invited to do this, she said, now, don't try to be too witty or charming, just be yourself. So, I'm going to try to tell it like it was, like I remember it, and I promise you I won't be too charming. Freedom was in the air back then. Blacks were trying to secure their rights, and the KKK and the segregationists didn't want the American way of life to change. And, of course, this brought challenges to law enforcement. There were many ways to achieve change back then. I'm going to give you one little example of how some people tried to affect that change. An old man sitting at the lunch counter having his lunch in a diner. And in come three bikers. The first biker picks up the old man's coffee and spits in it. The second biker reaches down and gets a hold of the old man's hamburger and takes a bite out of it. And the third biker flips over the old man's plate. And the old man quietly gets up and he leaves the diner. And they go over and they sit at the table and one of them says to the waitress, he wasn't much of a man. And she said, well, apparently he's not much of a truck driver either because he just backed his rig over three bikes out in the parking lot. <laughs> well, blacks 
didn't choose that way to affect change. They chose to do it in a peaceful way. They had their freedom rides, their sit-ins, and their boycotts, and their marches. They tried to do it peacefully. And this brought activities from the white segregationists and the Ku Klux Klan. They were interested in maintaining segregation. And the resistance by these groups brought law enforcement into a lot of situations where they were caught in the middle. A lot of people back then criticized the FBI because they said, we didn't do enough to protect some of these people. But what they didn't realize was that the FBI was not a national police force. We were restricted in what we could do by the laws that Congress had delegated us to enforce. For example, Secret Service handled the protection of the president and counterfeiting. Tax laws handled by the IRS. Immigration by ICE. And we had laws that were assigned to us. We didn't take sides. We didn't censor people. We protected the safety and the free speech and we fought hate and bigotry. And we used the laws that were available to us. We tried to ensure that all Americans had equality under the laws. Here are some of the cases that I personally was involved in during the Civil Rights era. And one of the first was the integration of the University of Alabama. Now, Mr. Henshaw probably knows a lot about this because he's a graduate of the University of Alabama. He got his master's degree there. He got his bachelor's degree at the Citadel. He was an associate professor at the University of Alabama. He was in the 82nd Airborne in Vietnam. He was a retired SAC and an Inspector General at the Tennessee Valley Authority. He knows probably firsthand by what was involved at the integration of the uh, University of Alabama. You have Governor George Wallace standing in the door, flanked by officers from the guard. On the opposite side, you have Attorney General Katzenbach with a U.S. Marshal on each side of him and they faced off. George Wallace was elected in 1962 and he promised the people of Alabama segregation. His stand there in the doorway was largely symbolic because President Kennedy nationalized the guard. The guard then was under the command of a general named Graham. Katzenbach faced Governor Wallace and he said, Sir, it is my duty to ask you to step aside under orders of the President of the United States. 
Governor Wallace had told his followers to remain peaceful while he made his remarks. And his remarks were about resentment on the part of people of Alabama for the federal government interfering in their segregation policies. He made a brief comment and he stepped aside peacefully. I was in the crowd mingling and watching for any violations of federal law. After he made his remarks and stepped aside, two black students, Vivian Malone and James Hood, entered the university auditorium door, filled out their paperwork, and history was made. The University of Alabama was integrated. And it was integrated at the time when Mr. Henshaw was an associate professor of military science in that school. I was a small part in the role of the integration of Alabama, but I felt like I had participated in history. Another case from that period was the murder of Dr. Martin Luther King by James Earl Ray. You may remember, Ray was a Wallace supporter, and at the time he owned a 66 Mustang, and he used that car to follow Martin Luther King to different places. There was evidence later that he followed to Canada and Mexico, but in 1968, he drove that car to Memphis, Tennessee, where he shot and killed Martin Luther King. Prior to his death, Dr. King gave his final speech to the sanitation workers in Memphis. It was called his mountaintop speech. Maybe some of you who have studied Dr. King remember. He said, There are difficult days ahead, but it doesn't matter. I have been to the mountaintop and I looked over and I saw the promised land. I may not get there, but we as a people will. Ray's car was found several days later abandoned at a housing project in Atlanta. I was assigned as a member of the team of FBI agents that searched that car. I collected the evidence that we got from the car and was assigned to fly it by a commercial airline from Atlanta to the FBI laboratory in Washington. In March 1969, Ray pled guilty and got 99 years. Later, he withdrew his plea, but he died in prison in 1998. More history. And I was part of it. You may have heard of the Birmingham Public Safety Director, 
Eugene Bull Connor. He used hoses and sick police dogs on the freedom marchers. I was one of the agents that interviewed Bull Connor. And the actions of Bull Connor helped bring about the Civil Rights Act later. He died in 1973 after a stroke. The major case I investigated under the Civil Rights Act was the Lemuel Penn murder case. Now, the FBI doesn't handle murder cases ordinarily, except on Indian reservations. But we went in to work this case at Athens, Georgia, at the direction of the president under the new Civil Rights Act. If you're interested in this case, you can go on the computer Look up Jack Simpson FBI and the whole confession and case is laid out for you to read. Also, there is a book out written by Bill Shipp, a writer for the Atlanta Constitution, and he acknowledges my role in preparing this book on page three that gives the entire case. And they tell me, <clears throat> Mr. Henshaw said he found it on Amazon. It has just been reprinted, if you're interested in that. Further, this case is part of the oral history in Washington, D.C. at the National Museum of Law Enforcement. Now, the basic facts of the Penn case are these. Lemuel Penn was a, an educator from Washington, D.C., and he was on summer camp training at Fort Benning, Georgia. Brown and Howard were two associates of his, and they were with him when they all completed their training and were headed back home to their families in Washington. They had quite a discussion about how to go safely back as there was a lot of activity going on, protests, KKK activity, and they tried to avoid being involved because they had no role whatsoever in the civil rights matters. They were traveling back through Athens, Georgia, and they pulled up to the monument, and Lemuel Penn took over as driver. Well, back then, in Athens, Georgia, we had two worlds. We had the academic community seated over here, and we had the rest of the community over here. We had the KKK parading around in their robes, carrying firearms, shooting into black homes, trying to keep blacks from integrating the varsity restaurant. Lemuel Penn and his two officer friends didn't know about this. They pulled up there and they changed drivers. And they had a District of Columbia tag on the car. And the Klansmen saw that plate and they said, there go some of President Johnson's boys. We're going to do something about this.
Cecil Myers, Howard Sims, Denver Phillips, Herbert Guest, and James Lackey, Klansmen that hung out at the Varsity and the open house restaurant, parading around intimidating black people. They followed them out of town. When they got to the Broad River Bridge, two Klansmen stuck a shotgun out the window, pulled the trigger, and killed Lieutenant Colonel Penn. The car bounced off the sides of the bridge. And the other two officers managed to grab the wheel and the brakes, put the brakes on, and keep from crashing. And they turned it around and headed back to Athens with the dead body of Lieutenant Penn. I was assigned at the time to investigate Klansman James Lackey. And after much patience and many interviews and with much care and investigation, one day he gave me a confession that broke this case. Here is the confession in part. On the morning of July the 11th, 1964, I was driving Cecil Myers' green Chevy accompanied by Howard Sims. Sims said the car with the DC plates occupied by three blacks were Johnson's boys, and he told me to follow the car out of Athens. We went out Highway 29, 72, and 172 near Colbert. Sims said, I'm going to kill me a black man. Pulled up alongside the car. Sims and Myers stuck their shotguns out the window and they killed Lieutenant Colonel Penn. They returned to Athens, cleaned the guns at Guest's garage. And Sims said, we shot one. I don't know if we killed him or not. Lackey said, we followed the colored men because we heard Martin Luther King might make Georgia a testing grounds with the Civil Rights Bill. We thought out-of-town Negroes might stir up trouble. We intended to scare them away. Lackey said, I was surprised that colored man was killed. Those son of a bitches killed that man. Lackey signed his eight page confession and said it was true. They knew he did not have to make it. They received no promises. He could have an attorney and it would be used against him in court. After that, Director J. Edgar Hoover, in August of 1964, wrote me this commendation. I have approved an incentive award for $200 in recognition of your outstanding performance in the civil rights case involving Herbert Guest and others. Your thoroughness and resourcefulness in conducting the investigation and the skill you demonstrated in interviewing James S. Lackey, one of the subjects, 
were of the highest caliber. As a result of your splendid effort, Blackie made a complete confession. Your exceptional services are appreciated. <laughs> As a young kid, J. Edgar Hoover was a hero of mine. I read all about the Dillinger and the Carpus Gang and Ma Barker and J. Edgar Hoover and the FBI. <clears throat> After that, all I ever wanted to be was an agent. And here is Director Hoover sending me a letter with an incentive award. You don't forget something like that. You always remember. I was so proud. I didn't know this at the time, but Bill Henshaw was in the 82nd Airborne. He was not in the FBI back then. But he likes to tell that I saved him from having to make a scheduled parachute jump by this confession. <laughs> and I'm going to let him take a couple of minutes and tell you just how I saved him from making a parachute jump. <laughs> Thank you, Jack. It's a pleasure to be with you today. It's a pleasure to stand any time with this line of history. Uh, a man that uh, he and I share just a little bit of history together. And I didn't know about Jack's confession at the time because I had not read the book. Uh, but I was on duty as first lieutenant in the 82nd Airborne Division. And when this case happened, uh, the Civil Rights Act had just passed. Uh, 1963, uh, things were, were bad, but in 1964, uh, there were a lot of tensions, and I was in Fort Bragg, North Carolina. I was raised in North, in North Carolina. I was familiar with segregation. Uh, my high school uh, desegregated in 1957. But when they killed Lieutenant Colonel Penn in the Army, they had crossed the line. They had killed one of ours. And even before we got notice that we were on alert for the division ready for us, uh, we were all angry about that. White people, African American people, Hispanic people, we were all mad because they had killed a brother. And there was tremendous pressure from the president on the military to do something. And the case rode on for about three or four weeks, but and still nobody had been found. We didn't know what the FBI was doing. We didn't know what the police were doing. But we knew that somebody had to do something. And so the orders came down. We we're going to make a two-company parachute jump into the Athens, Georgia area. We we're going to do, use three drop zones. Our vehicles were going to be transported out from Fort Gillum and brought over from Augusta. And we were going to teach these people down in Georgia a thing or two about taking the life of one of our brothers. And we were under a parachute shed. It was in the summertime. It was hot up in North Carolina. And we'd been there for about a day and a half. We were eating rations from a field kitchen. And we were just waiting to jump. And the first sergeant woke us up one afternoon. We were taking a nap. And he came down and says, Stand down, boys. He said, you're going back home, you're going back to the barracks. He said, the damned old FBI has done solve this case. We can go home. <laughs> and at the time, I'll tell you, I was terribly disappointed. And as I've told Jack and several others, when I found that, met Jack finally in 1990 and heard about his role in the confession. And we shared notes of our experiences in working Ku Klux Klan matters. I, I told him, I said, he, he cheated me out of a parachute jump that I wanted to make. <laughs> but, but, you know, when you stop and think about this, 
Uh, I've lived long enough to see a lot of changes, a lot of changes that should have happened long before, but didn't. And I know this, that if we had made that parachute jump, we weren't, we weren't bringing tear gas. I had 180 rounds of ball ammunition, three frag grenades, and two smoke grenades in my kit. And I know with my heart that there would have been several people killed. And I don't think there would have been many of my paratroopers. Uh, it was that tense. And that's how close I think we came to rip, just tearing apart the fabric of our society. Yeah, thank Jack. Thank you for the opportunity. Thank you, Sheriff, for the invitation. It's a it's a pleasure to stand before you guys and and relate just my part of this history that I find so special. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mr. Henshaw. I didn't realize how important this confession turned out to be. And when you tell it like you told it, and all the parachute jumps we uh, prevented and possible shooting and everything, I'm, I'm even more pleased to find out I was part of that. So during the civil rights era and after, uh, Eventually, I was assigned to Washington and the correspondence and tour area, and I wrote letters for Mr. Hoover for a while. And uh, later, I worked a lot of discrimination in housing cases. As law officers, you and I are working today together to fight hate and bigotry. I'm so proud that Sheriff Brown has provided me the opportunity to serve, and I'm proud to be serving with you and see how all the interests that you have shown in the community and the good work that you have done. We can never plow a field simply by turning it over in our minds. We have work to do. Change is hard to come by. You've got to have patience and work together. Seek equal justice and opportunity for everybody. And I think that's one of the goals of the Sheriff's Department here in Newton County. You and I are answering the call for dedicated public service, and I know we'll continue to do so. And one day you may be standing up here in my place telling others about your contributions to personal freedom. Don't try to be cute or charming. Just tell it like it is and as you remember. Serve with honor and dedication and maintain a high level of professionalism that you now have. Sheriff Brown, would you like to make a comment or two at this point? Thank you. Thank you. Good morning to all. Uh, I'll just be real brief. Uh, I want to thank Jack Simpson, Mr. Crenshaw. I want to thank you uh, for this uh, moment of education. I'm sure there's very few in here can even recall back to those days. I want to thank you. Thank you for your hard work. And as always, I enjoy your story. Always enjoy Mr. Mr. Crenshaw being around you in your presence. And it's an honor and, and pleasure again meeting you. I would ask that only just one thing, Mr. Crenshaw, if you would just share uh, with the, the group here the intentions of your group once you, if the drop had occurred in Athens, if you would. Sheriff, that was just because we, we talked about our mission when we uh, uh, made the parachute and first of all get on the ground and get the parachute off of you 
was to assemble, and then we were to round up all law enforcement, and we were to take them to a, <clears throat> a designated area, which is, and as I recall, there were two of them that were designated on the map, and they were going to basically put big fences around this, and all law enforcement were to be disarmed, and if they were unruly, they would be tied up and transported, and this is because just prior to the intended parachute jump, President Johnson was going to declare martial law in this part of Georgia. And now being part of law enforcement, I don't think know what I would think if some paratrooper came to disarm me from doing my job. And I, that's why I think the tear would have taken in the fabric. Uh, police officers would have never forgiven that. And I think that we came very dangerously close. And the fabric of our society is very, very tenuous. <clears throat> and I'll tell you what, every day when you're out there with the public, whether it's a traffic stop or a drug raid or anything else, you're at the place where it can be torn. And once it's torn, it's very difficult to mend. Mr. Crenshaw, on behalf of the Office of Sheriff, oh. we want to present you with a small token thank of appreciation you. just for coming out this morning and being with us. We thank you so much. Thank you.